Perhaps nobody is more familiar with the concept of potential and the letdown of falling short of possibility than us former gifted and talented kids. Despite being labeled as precocious and actually being able to spell precocious, some of us will never live up to our potential and we're instead faced with the inevitable burnout and disillusionment when we find out that unlike our childhood pizza hut, the real world doesn't care how many books you read this summer. Like, Fresh-faced, wide-eyed, hope-filled youths, the economy is also concerned with its own potential. And while measuring the potential is really different for an economy than for an elementary schooler, both need nurturing and support to be the best that they can be. So let's settle in for some circle time like we did when the world was fresh and new, pass around the feeling stick, and talk about how to tell if the economy is going to grow, shall we? And maybe afterwards we can have some parachute time. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa. And this is Study Hall, macroeconomics, but like the challenge version. When it comes to economic potential, we're really trying to determine what national output would be if our economy was the best it could be. And when it comes to economics, best generally means making as much stuff and therefore money as possible. Potential real GDP is the hypothetical place of ideal productivity. And despite its name, potential real GDP is not, in fact, real. Like money or the concept of one seven-year-old in a sandbox being more gifted and talented than another. That's because in economics, real doesn't mean an actual thing that actually exists, but instead adjusted for inflation. Potential real GDP is actually pretty much entirely theoretical. It's what would happen if we were as employed as we could be, using all our resources as efficiently as possible, making as much stuff as we could be, and living up to our true economic potential, unlike 95% of former gifted and talented kids. Now, an economy's potential can be harder to pin down than a kid's scholastic aptitude, at least in theory. Who is this multiple choice fill in the bubble test to tell me what I can and can't do? But there are some really important factors we can look at. Labor, or the total number of hours worked in a national economy is one really important factor that goes into a country's potential GDP. That's because the more labor you have, the more you can produce. And it's not just about how many workers you have, but how much each of those people works. In the US, we're all familiar with the concept of the 40 hour work week. In theory, this gives many workers the freedom to spend time with friends and family, take care of household chores, and binge the newest season of whatever reality dating show happens to be popping off. But say there's another country with a similar population that maintains a 50-hour work week because they value economic expansion more than who's getting that final rose. With all else being equal, they're gonna have a higher potential GDP because they're turning in more total labor hours. But it's not just the hours that matter but how you use them. There are a lot of other factors that can influence the productivity or how much a worker can produce, which in turn influences potential GDP. New technologies can up a country's potential GDP by doing just that. It might only take 11 hours of work today to be as productive as 40 hours of labor in the 1950s. And that's not thanks to three martini lunches in midweek golf games of yore. Think about it. People in the 50s used slide rules. Today, we have smartphones. The quality of the labor also matters when it comes to potential GDP. That includes stuff like skills and training, known as human capital. Basically, us laborers have certain knowledge and skills that we're selling for a specific wage. Like, I'm a really good YouTube host, a skill which I'm selling to the good people at study hall in return for a wage of And the more I learn, the better I get. That means it takes me fewer takes to nail that delivery and more of these little episodes I can crank out in a single hour. The two main sources of human capital are formal education, like the one you're getting now, and on-the-job training. On-the-job training can be anything from awkward training videos with terrible acting, followed by a true-false quiz, to mentorship by your really patient supervisor, to just the act of doing the thing and getting better and better with each passing day. It can also include learning fun corporate jargon like maximizing synergy and taking a deep dive into the impact of the customer journey, whatever that means. Circling back, these skills mean you can get more done with less effort and less time. This leads us to another fun work phrase, work smarter, 
not harder. Separate from human capital or the individual knowledge and skills of workers is a country's collective knowledge. When it comes to potential real GDP, this isn't how many digits of pi you have memorized, looking at you, Alina Brown, Cool Ridge Elementary Class of 89, but things like advancements in medicine, chemistry, physics, or engineering. Extensive national knowledge leads to increased potential output, because the more you know, the more you can produce. Another influence on potential GDP is physical capital. Not exactly what us gifted kids were known for. <laughs> I mean, long division? Sure, sign me up. But when it came time for the football unit in PE, <sighs> I still have nightmares. Jokes aside, when it comes to economics, physical capital actually refers to all the stuff companies invest in to help them make whatever it is they make. It's stuff like ergonomic desk chairs, factory buildings, transport trucks, and zen rooms for anxious software engineers. All of these goods that go into making final goods but aren't actually part of that final good are known as capital goods. You good? They're necessary for companies to up production of final goods, which are what actually count in GDP, which is why physical capital is so important in figuring out a country's potential real GDP. And then there's the legal, political, social, and cultural framework in a country, known as social infrastructure. Also, not exactly what us gifted and talented kids were known for. In economics, social infrastructure, or social institutions, includes things like a country's government and legal system, or access to education. For instance, in a country with a functional and reliable legal system, businesses have to obey laws and regulations. You know, in theory. A country that has a corrupt legal system may not be able to maximize productivity if some corporations are more protected than others. So maybe it's actually in our best interest to crack down on corrupt business moguls rather than letting them get away with murder thanks to thinly veiled political bribes via lobbying. Just a thought. The final ingredient to potential real GDP is natural talent. I mean, natural resources. Things like land, oil, diamonds, gold, or rubber, you know, to make those little erasers on those number two pencils. Just like some kids in my class were gifted with seemingly effortless predispositions for things like playing the piano or fine motor control necessary to master cursive, by coincidence of geography, some countries simply have stuff. All else being equal, a country with vast gold mines is gonna have a higher potential real GDP than those without. Of course, it's worth noting that we're only talking about potential here. And when it comes to real, real GDP, lots of countries blessed with abundant natural resources like Venezuela, Angola, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo score much lower. This is known as the resource curse, or economic troubles that come from focusing too much of a country's production on one specific sector, like petroleum. Of course, centuries of pillaging and exploitation from resource-hungry Europeans may have had something to do with it too. When we take a look at all these factors together, we can get a pretty good idea of what a country's real GDP could look like, potentially. As with everything in economics, experts love to throw all this information up on a graph, creating what's called a long-run aggregate supply curve, which is drawn out at the level of our potential real GDP. Translated to plain English, that just means how much stuff a country can crank out, keeping these potential real GDP determinants in mind. For our long-run aggregate supply graph, our x-axis represents real GDP, and our y-axis shows price level. But the funny thing about this graph is it looks an awful lot like the brick wall my career ran into after graduating top of my class from college. That is to say, completely vertical. That's because the job market is like so tough, and it's really much easier than you'd think to get stuck in middle management. I mean, because price level has no influence on long-run aggregate supply or potential real GDP. The only stuff that shifts this line is those variables like labor, technology, and capital. And those shifts are what economists are really interested in when it comes to our long-run aggregate supply graph. If a country increases access to education, expands its labor force, and expunges its corrupt politician, the line might shift to the right as potential real GDP increases. But if a country loses physical or human capital thanks to war or natural disasters, your potential real GDP will decrease, and the vertical line of our long-run aggregate supply graph shifts left. Economists most often use the long-run aggregate supply graph to compare potential real GDP to real GDP itself. And since potential GDP is just a hypothetical, you'll notice that it's almost always off. Sometimes, like notorious slacker Amy Spakowski, who went on to a life of high-powered corporate lawyerdom, 
A country's real GDP can actually exceed its potential. This is known as a positive output gap and can lead to some pretty gnarly inflation. It also means economists have to adjust their predictions about how variables like labor, human and physical capital, and technology might affect growth to get a more accurate read in the future. But when the economy, like yours truly, comes up short of its potential, known as a negative output gap, it's stuck hearing about it at every family reunion ever. I mean, the government may need to adjust its policies to help maximize its wealth of resources. I am definitely not projecting here. There are lots of things a government can do to encourage a trend of sustainable growth, or growth that can increase potential GDP in the long run. But the path towards achieving economic potential isn't as straightforward as it seems. Sure, increasing capital or labor will increase potential GDP somewhat, but at a declining rate as time goes on. This is called the diminishing marginal product. You might remember this concept from our episode on labor demand. Each additional person contributes less to a company's marginal production. Same goes for potential real GDP. All else equal, every additional bit of capital or hour of labor by itself contributes less to the total output. And because they contribute at a declining rate, they can't be the long run sources of potential GDP growth on their own. For potential GDP to really keep up with steady growth, we've gotta up that productivity. And to do that, governments and firms have to do some big investing in new technologies, scientific studies, and infrastructure projects like Freeways, yes, but also in people. See, if a country spends on people-focused areas like healthcare, it boosts that human capital and makes the workforce way more productive in the long term. Making high-quality education accessible is another really important step. And I'm not just talking about notorious, highly selective, but somewhat arbitrary advanced laning systems in elementary schools. To make our economic dreams come true, all kids need access to good pre-K through 12 education, plus affordable higher education too, because the more human capital, education, and knowledge the workers have, the more countrywide knowledge a nation has. These kinds of social infrastructure work with those technological advances and natural resources to increase long-term economic potential. So we can be all that we can be, productivity-wise at least. Potential is complicated. It's abstract, often unachievable, and the source of thousands of dollars of my therapy bills. But while I'll probably never be an award-winning astrophysicist or even a non-award-winning astrophysicist, we do have our shot at achieving our economic potential. Supports like healthcare and affordable education, coupled with advances in technology and infrastructure, help us maximize productivity and be all that we can be. Or, at the very least, improve life for workers across the country. It's like the inspirational poster in my fifth grade classroom put it. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, uh, comment on whether you think you've met your full potential, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.